Uh, so my name is Damien Spear. I'm a detective sergeant with the Regional uh, uh, Organised Crime Group, part of the Regional Cybercrime, for Yorkshire and the Humber. So we are uh, a collaborative uh, group of police officers and police staff that cover the four Yorkshire forces. So we cover North, South, West Yorkshire and Humberside. Um, uh, and obviously my role is um, I'm one of the sergeants who looks after what's referred to as cyber protect and cyber prevent. So looking at trying to pre protect people from becoming the victim of cyber crime and also preventing individuals getting involved in cyber crime. So I come here today to talk to you a little bit about cyber security uh, and about cyber choices, which is the campaign that we're doing to try and encourage um, awareness around the Computer Misuse Act um, and also sort of steer people away from getting involved in some of that seedier side of the internet and uh, making sure that people are using their tech skills for good. So have you guys been into the atrium and done the, we've got, some of you have, yeah, yeah, and some of you sort of pilfered all of our freebies and got the squishy board and things like that. So if you haven't, come down afterwards um, and we've got a bit of a quiz and some, some freebies and things that we'll give out. Um, so um, I've been in the police now for just shy of 20 years. Um, so before I came to the region, I was in South Yorkshire, so just across the border, and I was a sort of detective constable investigating cybercrime. Um, and then I've gone for a promotion, been involved in safeguarding, and I'm now the sergeant at the regional cybercrime. So once we've gone, I've gone through the, the presentation, towards the end as well, I'll just cover some of the other roles within the policing, because it's not the way it was when I joined 20 years ago, where you joined as a uniformed police officer, spent a bit of time in, in uniform, driving a panda car around, and then kind of going to see the idea there's lots of other opportunities and avenues to get involved in policing from a sort of cyber sort of perspective as well. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of touch on the current cyber threats that we're seeing within policing. Um, I'll have a bit of a look at what I can do or what we can do as individuals to protect ourselves from becoming a victim of cyber crime. Um, we'll have a look at why people get involved in cyber crime in the first place. And then we'll have a bit of a talk about this cyber choices campaign that we're doing to try and encourage people away from actually getting involved in cyber crime. Um, so I mentioned that I work in this sort of middle area. So within policing, we have four P's is what they refer to. So we have pursue. So the idea of that is that is your traditional CID that will investigate. So that's where I was about five years ago, uh, investigating cyber crime. So people who are hacking into computer networks, people who are uh, involved in sort of like getting involved in uh, sending phishing emails, you know, fraud, that sort of thing. I would investigate that, try and find out who's done it, prosecute them and send them off to court to, to be dealt with appropriately. Um, but what we've realized certainly with cybercrime and cybersecurity is actually we should be doing a lot more of this. We should be a lot more about protecting individuals. So protecting people, individuals, businesses, organizations, charities to prevent them from being a victim in the first place. Because what we don't want to do is investigate once it's already happened, let's stop it happening in the first place. So we've got this national network that I supervise for the region, and we've got this prevent network as well. So this is about engaging with individuals that are on the cusp of getting involved in cybercrime and saying, actually, there's a lucrative career out there that you could potentially get involved in. There's lots of opportunities. Let's use your skills for good. And then the last area that we also look at is this idea of prepare. So what are we going to do if we become the victim of a cybercrime? Um, so what have we got in terms of an instant response? So if somebody manages to get in and say, take down this school network, what plans have they got in place to manage this? Um, good example of that is obviously when uh, we have um, lockdown hits and suddenly everyone's got to work remotely. What's the plan? How are we going to manage this? What if all of our internet goes down? You know, what's our backup plans? So this preparedness. Um, just some, these are interesting facts from a national study around cybercrime. So the average age of someone committing cybercrime, 17. So we're talking about a lot, a, a much younger demographic of, of in, individuals involved in crime than there are other types of crime. So when we look at things like drug dealing or theft or anything else like that, the age of cybercrime is very young. Um, in terms of sort of the threat, £190,000 a day being stolen through cybercrime on individuals and victims in the UK. So it's a real big problem for UK PLC. Um, and in terms of the age, we've got people as young as 14 that are ending up going to court and getting convicted in respect to what they're doing with computers. So it's about that awareness. 61% of hackers started before they were the age of 16. Yeah, so the people with these tech skills, it's about getting in there early. And one small business in the UK is hacked every 19 seconds. 
So this is a real problem for the UK and it's about how we fix that. Um, when we look at the sort of type of cybercrime that, that I deal with, so obviously there's a lot of types of crime out there, but really I'm talking about crimes involving computers. So we've got on the left my idea of this theft. So I'm going to use my skills, I'm going to hack into a computer in order to steal the data or to do something where I can get that person to pay me some money. You know, I can send them an email purporting to be from one of their suppliers and say, here's my bank account details and get them to send the money to me instead of, you know, the actual supplier themselves. So we have kind of the theft side of things. Or well, the other side is this idea of access. So if you all heard of ransomware? Yeah. Yeah. So ransomware... So, yeah, so this idea that it's some malicious software that I'm going to get, I'm going to infect your computer with this malicious software and then you can't access any of your data because it's all encrypted unless you pay me a ransom and I will then give you a decryption key that will allow you to get access to that data again. Massive problem and especially for businesses about how we can do that and how we protect ourselves against it. I'll come on to that in a second. Absolutely, yeah, the WannaCry attack. Wasn't necessarily targeted at the NHS, they were just one of the big victims of it, yeah. Um, DDoS, distributed denial of service. So this idea of booting, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a load of computers that are infected with some malicious software, and I'm going to get all those computers to send a load of information, a load of traffic at a computer server or an internet address, and basically get it to crash, yeah. So with computer games, yep. Yeah. So yeah, online that's gaming. The most common one. Yeah. Because it'll overload the server and then the server will shut down for about uh, 10, 10 minutes shortness. Yeah. So just clean it up and then reactivate. Yeah. So if I, from a gaming perspective, if I want to try and win at a game, I can actually DDoS. I can actually DDoS my mates' home, you know, router their home internet to stop them from actually being able to connect. Yeah, but there's like uh, ones I use peer to peer and uh, um, dedicated uh, servers. So I can't remember if there's a difference between them. Uh. <laughs> Again, it, I mean, from an offence point of view, it's just about preventing that access or prevent that computer from working. At a business level, if I run a business, a successful business, buying and selling things online, and someone takes my website down, that's going to have a massive impact on me from a business. Yeah. Um, and then we get things like account takeover. So we'll talk about some of the simple things that we can put in place to protect ourselves. But if I can get into your account and I can change your password, you no longer have access to that account because I now control it. Yeah, so those sort of things. Or similarly, I'll get onto your website and I'll mess around with your website, change your website, change what information is showing on your website, things like that. Um, and then things are starting to change as well from a, from a threat perspective. So we have the wonderful internet of things. So now anything that can connect to the internet will connect to the internet. So we will have internet connected fridges. We've got internet connected toasters. You can get an internet connected a Wi-Fi uh, clothes peg that's then got sensors on the clothes peg and it will tell you the moisture level, you know, the humidity and whether or not it's raining. Now I've got an old school thing, similar, it's called a window and it tells me if it's raining. But pretty much anything nowadays that can connect to the internet, someone will have designed something that will connect to the internet. Yeah? The issue you come with that is, whoever it is who's designed this internet toaster hasn't got cybersecurity at the forefront of their mind. So actually there's a massive vulnerability around the internet of things, which is causing a big problem. Um, along comes, unfortunately, COVID and lockdown, and suddenly everyone's working from home, schooling from home, yeah, and we're having to actually engage. So from a IT perspective, you know, the college, if you're here at the college, they'll have a number of devices around the college, you know, Wi-Fi, whatever else it is, around the college they've got to manage. Everyone's suddenly now working from home and, and having to teach from home and school from home and all that sort of stuff. Suddenly it becomes a lot more complicated in terms of how people are accessing the network, which opens up vulnerabilities for people to try and hack into. Um, and along with that, you, get, you bring your own device. So before, we'd have had however many laptops or PCs that were all exactly the same make, all exactly the same spec. So in terms of me managing it as an IT manager, it was quite easy because they were all the same. So when a patch comes out, I can just make sure they've all had those patches. Now we've got multiple different devices. 
We've got people accessing on laptops, MacBooks, phones, all these different methods. So actually it becomes a lot more complicated to make sure that I'm secure. Um, and when we look at who it is who's actually attacking us, who are the threat actors? Who are the people that are actually attacking us? This idea of this wonderful individual with a hoodie, black hoodie, it's gotta be a black hoodie as well, uh, sat in the basement typing code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that it's not, that is not the hackers that we're seeing. Anybody can be involved in comp uh, computer misuse set. As long as you've got a device that's connected to the internet, you can potentially use that. So we're trying to steer away from that. Uh, and from a business perspective, when we look at it, we've kind of got <coughs> internal and external threats. So internal, the number one threat to any organization is an accidental user. And so when we talk about things like phishing, and people receiving phishing emails, what they're trying to do is get somebody to click on a link, which then will enable it for somebody to get into your network. Yeah, I think the, the, the wonderful uh, acronym, PICNIC, the problems in chair, not in computer. Yeah, so we do a lot of sort of staff awareness. Actually, these, this is where your risk is. Um, and you do get some malicious people involved. So from a business, if you've got somebody who's, you know, potentially going through some sort of, you know, uh, disciplinary issues or potentially leaving the organisation, you know, has the business set themselves up. So when that person leaves, all their access is removed and things like that. From a school or an education perspective, you know, have we got individuals that are deciding to hack into the school network? I'm going to take the school network down for fun. You know, the, the, the analogy being instead of pulling a fire alarm, I'll take down the school network. Yeah, that sort of thing. So malicious, deliberately doing it. And then from an external perspective, a range of individuals who might be involved. So we've got that state-sponsored attack we've talked about. Yeah, so actually WannaCry, suspected have come from North Korea as a state-sponsored attack. Wasn't actually supposed to have been deployed. It sounds like it was an accident when it actually got deployed, but obviously then proliferated across the internet. And what we found was that the NHS was not a target of WannaCry. They just had really bad IT structures and really bad patching. So they had a load of old devices that were running on unpatched uh, systems and therefore they got hit really badly. But there's loads of other companies that got hit as well. So we're not likely to get ta targeted by a state-sponsored attack, but we might be collateral damage. Um, we then have this idea of organized crime. So ransomware, so this is ransomware being run as a business. So I've got a business model of when I'm running my ransomware, I'll deploy it onto computers and then I'll be requesting that ransom, that payment, uh, and they will have, within that organised thing, they'll have a, a customer support service. You know, you've been a victim of ransomware, I can't work out what I need to do, contact our customer support team and they'll help you through your ransomware. Yeah, so they're running it as a business, unfortunately. Um, when we talk about hacktivists, people heard of Anonymous? Yeah. That's probably the big one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Did you hear about the latest one when they attacked the uh, um, Texas governor, the Republican governor in Texas, uh, because of their anti-abortion laws? Um, so they took down the, the uh, Republican government, uh, the Republican Party's website and did a load of stuff on that as a, a protest around their anti-abortion laws. So it might be politically if motivated. I, if I remember correctly, uh, Anonymous right now, they're not the same as before, because like most of them are in jail or just gone away. Is that true? Or? <laughs> um, I, I'm not 100% certain, to be honest. I know that Anonymous kind of stood for this idea that they had a political motivation and it wasn't about sort of money or anything else like that or, or tech. It was about that idea that, you know, that they'd have a reason for doing something. Um, but what we're seeing, uh, you know, potentially a lot more of is this opportunistic. And you were talking about, you know, a 12 year old kid. The idea is now, if I want to learn how to do something, there is a guide that tells me how to do it. Um, Anonymous used to be like justice people. So that so if somebody was getting targeted, you'd contact them and then they would uh, like contact the other person yeah. asking for an apology or something. And if you didn't, they would, they would get serious action. So they would put like, malicious computer software into your computer and they would force you to comply to them. Yeah. So it used to be a justice action of them asking for like, for, like an apology or something. Or if they didn't agree with something, they'd go to the government and say this isn't right and hack into that website and then like force other people to follow their action on it. Yeah. And then they used to do that, but now it's more like they go for the highest bidder. So whoever pays them the most money, they'll just do that instead. So it's changed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this, you know, the anonymous is kind of like the, the, the big one, isn't it, with the masks and things, but it's that idea, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and the trouble is now, if you want to know how to do something, you can go online and you can find an idiot's guide of how to do it. Yeah. So there are, you know, tutorials, there are videos that will teach you how to do this sort of thing. Um, so whether you're going onto YouTube, Discord, forum pages, wherever you're going, if you, if you have that interest, you can find out how to do it. You don't have to go down to the library and get a book out on how to hack. Um, and the other option we get is we do see some competitors. So from a business perspective, if I'm trying to do some sort of business, it may be one of my competitors either wants to take me out to prevent me from competing against them, or they want to get into my network to steal my proprietary software or you know, you know, whatever it might be. So we kind of get a range of individuals that are involved in it. Um, so from a protect perspective, a lot of the work that we're now doing is trying to push out a message of, you know, actually this is about, if we put simple procedures into place, the majority of crimes that get reported through to us wouldn't have happened in the first place. So we have a range from both like an individual level up to sort of small and medium businesses up to sort of like massive tech industries, yeah? So the, the advice that we give has got to be tailored to the audience that we're talking about because we can put whatever level of cybersecurity in place, but actually it's going to cost a lot of money and is it really fit for purpose if it's just, you know, a sole trader, that sort of level, yeah? Um, in terms of from an individual perspective, the cur current guidance from the government, the National Cyber Security Council, is something called Cyber Aware. And what they've really done is just say there's some real key, simple things that we can put in place that will protect us from the majority of attacks at an individual level. Um, so the number one being creating a separate password for email and using a strong password called three, we're using three random words. Have you heard of the three random words? No, I mean, I just use random password generator. Okay. So that's good if you're going to use password generator that's brilliant um, this is about just get, get kind of getting everyone to, to a minimum if everyone's up here then it becomes a lot harder for people to be easily hacked um, people understand what i mean when i say two-factor authentication yeah yes yeah. that's what i like to hear i'll move on yeah so this idea that actually what's two-factor authentication about then what why is it help us why is it beneficial uh, like Types. Different the, types, yeah. The, the main one is where it would make you download an app which gives you then a small window of a code that you have to input into when it can't actually access it. Yeah. So if you try to access it, it will send you a code to your phone onto the app, so then you have to put the code in and access it. So, so if we have a ridiculously complex password that's like 5,000 characters long and it's got all these weird hexadecimal <coughs> things, all this sort of stuff, yeah, and I accidentally tell it to somebody, then they've got my username and password. With multi-factor authentication, it's not just the username and password you need. You need a second form or a multiple form of authentication. So be that, you know, I've got an app on my phone and it'll ask me what the code is on that phone. So if somebody, some hacker in China manages to get my username and password, they can't use it because they also need access to my phone to get that code off my phone. Yeah. So a lot of um, the majority of major companies and organizations will now have two-factor authentication installed automatically and it's just setting it up. So if you're on Facebook, Instagram, any of your email accounts, those sort of things, make sure you've got two-factor authentication set up because that is the thing that's going to protect you the most. Yeah. Having complex passwords is brilliant. And we definitely need to have that. But if you have two-factor authentication attached to it, you know, that, that hacker then needs access to your physical device that's in your pocket in order for them to get into your, into your accounts. And that's what's going to secure you. Um, people heard of, uh, have I been pwned? Yeah. So it's a, web, it's a website, it's run by Troy Hunt um, and it's got involvement with law enforcement. But basically what he's done is he's identified all these large breaches. So where a company is hacked and all their data is stolen, yeah, and then that's then listed for, for sale on wherever else it is, he'll get a copy of that data, which will have the username and the passwords and the, other, the information that's been stolen by the hackers. So you can go to that website, you can put in your email address and it'll say, your email address was subject to a hack of this company where you had an account. And it gives you that idea that you know that your information's been you know, c compromised and you can change the passwords or you know, make sure you've got the right sort of level of security. Right, can you can't just use a former email? Like, if you just sign up to a Dutch website, you can just use a private email and just um, use out your actual email. Yeah. So, I'm not going to go down the line of what you mean by dodgy, dodgy website, but if you want to go to the I Love Cats website, because you love cats, and you want to create an account on the I Love Cats website just for the day to see what's on there, then yeah, you can use a throwaway email address. That's great. Yeah, if it's going to be an account you're going to regularly use, then you're probably going to want to be able to have an, an email address that you control and own, sort of thing. 
Uh, sorry, I was asked a question by a student in one of my lessons. Have I been followed? That is, is a legit website, not like some kind of false flag operation, like a phishing operation run by a... No, 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 it's, yes, yeah, legitimate it's operation, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Sure, so <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and, and all it is, is it, it's just a, a big a big database of all the compromised data. So you can say, has my email address subject to that? Uh, and it will say, yes, it was in this breach that we know about. So it gives you that sort of awareness and that heads up. Um, so yeah. The only other advice that they're giving from a national perspective is making sure that we're updating our devices. So hopefully, you know, your smartphones, your, your, your laptops, things like that will come with automatic updates. Just making sure you're ticking the box. Yeah. Windows do something called Patch Tuesday. So every Tuesday they bring out a load of updates and it's normally about 12 o'clock. And for those of us who are working on a computer, about 12 o'clock on a Tuesday, it'll say, oh, I need to reset you. And you're like, oh, I'm in the middle of doing my work. It's like the reason that it wants to reset it is because of those updates that Windows has sent out. Yeah, and those updates are on the back of the fact that we know about a vulnerability. Yeah, so if we patch them, then those known vulnerabilities can't be hit by us. And then the last one is about backing up our data. So if we back up our data and we get hit by something like ransomware, then you can just go, whatever, reset, back it up, crack on. So from a user perspective, making sure you've got those important material backed up. So if you are the victim yourself personally of ransomware or something else like that, you've got all the, the information that you want held somewhere. Um, my wife decided in her infinite wisdom that she wanted to collate all of the photos of our children into one laptop to go through and make sure that they were nice and they were ordered and then dropped the laptop down the stairs and smashed it. So that hard drive, which was the sole place where she'd put all of our photos of our kids, is now in pieces on the laptop, on the floor. I wasn't impressed. So my question was, where's the backup? Um, so yeah, uh, making sure you've got that backup of any information that you uh, want to hold. On the have I, have I been found uh, website, because I've searched it right now, it says I have been, but it, it says it was like three years ago. Yeah. Um, so then the question is, if you've gone onto that website, you've looked, you've put in the thing and you think, where, what, what, what account is it that's been pwned? And then you go, oh, actually what password and username potentially was using at a time. And if you're using a different one on every single account, that's great. The problem we have is that actually, um, on, on average, people have got over a hundred different accounts online. And if we're saying you need a unique username and password per account, who can remember that? And that's the idea where they're saying, actually, from a, from a user, you know, just a home user perspective, save your passwords in your browser. Have a really complex password, but then just save it. Yeah. So actually, it then becomes a lot harder for the hacker rather than doing password one, two, three, or whatever it might be. That sort of thing. So yeah. Password, password. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Password, password. Yeah. And then from a business perspective, what we tend to see is that businesses have something where it'd be like, you need to change your password every month. For, for security reasons. So I'll have password one as my password. And then next month I need to change my password. My password's now password two. And then I need to change password. My password's now password three. If I've been the breach of, if a victim of a data breach three months ago, it's not particularly hard for me to work out what's gonna be password four. Yeah, so that sort of idea, trying to change people's uh, awareness and things. Um, okay, quick video from the net. Oh, it's not very loud, sorry. Um, it's obviously not for today, but we do do a lot more bespoke advice when we start talking to businesses because that's going to be a lot more complex in terms of you know, user control and access. And from a, from a school perspective, different people within the school should have access to different parts of the network and nobody should be able to have full access to the network unless they're an administrator. And if you're an administrator, you shouldn't really just be using your administrator account to do what you want to do. You should have your own personal account 
as a staff member and then only log on as an administrator to do other things. So there's lots of specific advice we give for businesses and then there's certain sort of key areas around specific sectors. Um, this year they've done it, you can access CMD, but the first year you can access CMD completely. Like yeah. There's nothing and like anything was blocked. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So we go, uh, we'll do, you know, when we do work with businesses, we'll talk to them about their sort of infrastructure and things like that and what a, a typical user can access. So things like, you know, the command line prompt. As a user, who actually needs to use that? You know, if you're Joe Bloggs and you're working in a finance department, why do you need a command line interface on a computer? You don't. If you're a Linux user, then but then you'd be using Linux, and so you'd be sitting there going, okay. But for the general population, they're not going to be doing command line interface. Yeah. Um, so a, 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 a corporation we worked with, any user could run PowerShell, and any re user could run a script on PowerShell of any type. And I was like, um, big red flag here. Who's your administrator? This shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do that. So it's controlling that. So we do a lot of work with businesses because obviously it's a lot more complicated when we talk about cybersecurity. And then we do have specific guidance uh, and training around certain sectors. So doing a lot of work at the moment with schools and education around sort of cybersecurity um, for those as well. Um, everyone happy with the idea when I'm talking about phishing? Yeah. Have you guys started getting phishing emails through? Yeah. So phishing, your emails, smishing, your text messages, vishing, your, your phone calls, yeah, purporting to be from somebody. Um, so when I used to investigate crime, you'd have a crime come through and it'd be, you know, your victim, Joe Bloggs, and then you'd phone up. You'd say, hello, I'm the police. You've reported being the victim of crime. Yes, yes, I have. So I just need to know some more information about it so I can investigate it properly. Yeah, that's fine, I'll tell you everything. Well, I've just phoned you out of the blue and said I'm a police officer. How do you know I'm a police officer? No, 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 it's, it's fine, I'll trust you. You know, perhaps you want to verify who I am. Why don't you, I'll say, phone me back, call 101, ask to get put through to my office, and then you can speak to me and you know that I'm a real police officer. And 99 times 100, no, 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 it's fine, I'll trust you. I'm like, yes, this is probably why you've become the victim in the first place. So nobody in a professional organisation should have a problem with somebody being challenged. If you're challenging your identity, that's fine. Go through an, a, a process to verify I am who I say I am. Um, so... The thing with social engineering and phishing and all that sort of stuff is it kind of, if I want to hack into your computer or your network, then what I'm going to do is I'm potentially going to do some sort of vulnerability assessment on your network to identify what operating systems you're running, what versions of operating systems you're running. I'm then going to look at known vulnerabilities against those operating systems and versions to identify whether or not there might be a vulnerability I can exploit. I might have to write some code and then I have to inject that code into, I'll do a load of complex stuff to potentially get into your network. Alternatively, I'm going to get you to give me access. Yeah, so this idea, we're not going to hack the computer, I'm going to hack the person. That's all that phishing is all about. And it relies on general social cues. So as a society, we are sort of like brought up to be nice, to be pleasant, to be helpful, and also not really to challenge when somebody says something that you're not, okay, I'll do it. If you say I'll do it, I'll do it, okay. Yeah, so it relies on all these sort of general social cues to make us do things. So here we go, I've got my email from Netflix. And it says, oh, sorry, you need to uh, update your account. And there we go, nice big red button saying click here. Yeah, I get that email through. I'm not really paying attention. It's Friday at half past four. Yeah, and I'm going, oh, sorry. I, you know, and I click on the button. It'll take me to a landing page, which looks just like Netflix, and just enter your username and password. And they're just going to steal my credentials and then potentially use that to either attack other accounts. So if I've got a username and password for Netflix, from a normal perspective, a large number of people in this country, that would be the same username and password that they've used for Amazon, for eBay, for all these other online accounts. I so I'm just going to shove those and... Oh uh, yeah, it's kind of the same as the, uh, the one with uh, Google, uh, uh, like about YouTube. Like, I know a bunch of uh, YouTube creators were tricked uh, into like, uh, like I, I forgot the exact details, but it was like something, like they had to talk with them about uh, Oh yeah, your channel was an entry level for monetization. Like a lot of people kind of fall for it, but uh, some kind of didn't, and they realized that oh yeah, it isn't really true. So yeah. Stuff. yeah. And all that the phishing email is going to have on there is there's a nice urgency to it. I've got to do it now. And if I don't do it now, there's an implication. Yes. If I don't click on this link, then I'm going to lose my account. 
Yeah. If I've gone onto Netflix and I can't remember my password, and I've gone, please reset my password, and then I get an email through saying verify it's you, then I'm expecting that, aren't I? If it's come out of the blue, then obviously there's things to be concerned about. TV licensing, exactly the same sort of idea. Need to do it now, and if you don't do it now, there's going to be a fine. So this kind of idea that there's this sort of threat, this underlying sort of suggestion. Um, and it's not just emails that we're getting these through. So it's really easy now to spoof the telephone number that you're coming from. Your phone is actually the, uh, the fraudsters sort of uh, helping the fraudster. If I get a text message from HSBC, and I've previously had text that I've banked with HSBC, I may well have received legitimate text messages from HSBC. My fraudster sends something through and puts themselves and say, say it's coming from HSBC. Yeah, and your phone will then put that text message into the same text message chain. So now it makes it look even more legitimate, yeah. Um, and then again, the fraudsters are straight on it with anything new. So COVID hits, suddenly we're going to have, uh, you know, there's issues around you've been caught, you know, if you go out, you're going to get a fine, or, you know, there's the virus, there's the virus, there's the vaccine, so you're now eligible for an early vaccine. Just click on this link and fill in these forms. The one at the bottom here, that's actually a legitimate track and trace message that I got when my friend tested positive. And it's going to this address, https contact dash tracing dot ph dot. And it's like, how do I know if that's legitimate or not? You know, we're not actually helping ourselves from a government either if we're sending weird sort of text messages that we're supposed to click on these links. Um, so some issues there. Um, and the other issue from a phishing perspective is people sort of th seem to think that, you know, oh, somebody's fallen foul of a phishing. You know, you've been duped, you're an idiot. But actually loads of professionals fall foul of this. You know, we have large sort of frauds. This is a um, football company, 2 million euros, you know, that they've paid into the wrong account because they've been fished. Yeah, so things like that. So professionals, you know, police officers, you know, solicitors, lots of people fall foul of this. And really it's just sort of like rely on this idea that there's this urgency or this sort of like um, legitimacy to this email. Quite often sent on a Friday afternoon at about three o'clock when everyone wants to go home. Yeah, or can you just do this? Yeah, right then. Um, and the real, the, the simple advice is just don't use the link within that email address or the, that text message or wherever else it is. Yeah, go and look for it somewhere else. I got contacted by my bank to say that there was some fraud on my account. Can you just please verify your sort of like password and something else? You phoned me. Who the hell are you? No. Hang up. Get my card out. On the back of the cards, the if lost or found phone number. Phone that number. Get put through. Can you put me through to your fraud department? Do, 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 do. End up speaking to the same person who says, yeah, nobody ever does this. Well, perhaps they should. Perhaps there should be something more in place to prevent fraudsters from making it easy for them. Um, and again, looking at where you can go for that legitimate sort of contact, so the website or um, calling their number, uh, logging into your account. So if you have got an email from Netflix, just logging onto your Netflix account will confirm whether or not that's a legitimate message as well. Um, and a lot of companies will tell you what they won't ask for. So if you get a text message from your bank with a one-time code or something else like that, it will say, we will never ask for this. Yeah. So when you get a forward store or somebody else phoning up saying, what's the one-time code that you just received? Well, actually, they would never ask for that in the first place, so kind of warning around those. Uh, okay, um, oh, last thing is just, if you do get one, then just report it through to that email, just report at phishing.gov.uk, because what we will do as a government is we will look at, well, where's, the, where's that email come from? Who's the sender? Because we can add that sender to a blacklist, so then your email provider will say, no, that's come from that dodgy email address, we're not allowing it. Or we can identify victims whose accounts have been taken over by criminals uh, and sort of like get them back. Um, we'll also look at where it's trying to send you to. So what domain is it, you know, when you click on that link, where's it taking to you? And we can take those fake websites down as well. And the same with text messages, send them through to that spam, but in te telephone number. And again, we can look at those telephone numbers and take the telephone numbers potentially off, off the network and things like that. Um, isn't there a website where you can Yes, so there is a anti-marketing something something yes where you can put it on and that's great for legitimate companies. Yeah, um, then you but, yeah. Email yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can say that I don't want to be contacted and here's my so a legitimate company should say that number doesn't want to be contacted. So it kind of gives you a bit of an idea. It's probably more likely to be for yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, so just for the last sort of like um, 
short while, I just want to quickly touch on the other side of my work, which is this prevent work. Yeah, so a lot of the work that we now do is looking about that difference between what is legal and illegal um, and making people have that informed decision. Yeah, so people understand what the law is and therefore when people go off and do stuff, then we can say, well, you knew what the law is, you knew it was legal and you've carried on and made the, the informed decision to, to do what you want to do. Um, and then sort of divert individuals who may be on that cusp and sort of saying, actually, let's not go down that rabbit hole. Here's this opportunity, these legal you know, careers and things like that. And so for those of you who've done the, the, uh, the quiz downstairs, that's what a lot of it's about, you know, the stick and the carrot sort of approach. Um, so just looking, this is one of a number of different pathways. So don't think this is the only way that people get involved in cybercrime, but we've done, there's been a lot of research about why people get involved. When we, so we talk to people who are now potentially in prison on the back of committing serious crime and say, well, what, what, what pathway, you know, how did you end up sitting in front of me having you know, just been sort of convicted for five years for computer misuse act offences. And so we sort of look at this sort of like idea. Um, so this is just using the, uh, the gaming sort of idea. So we've got somebody who's into gaming and then they go, right, I'm now gonna start doing it online. So I'm now, you know, online gaming. And then I've worked out the certain ways that I can modify that game to enable me to play better or to cheat the system. So I can do some modification. Um, then I'll start potentially getting involved in talking to other like-minded individuals on forums, on Discord, or whatever else it might be. Yeah. And then I'm going to start that level of where I'm DDoSing people off, off games. I'm doing minor cybercrime in order to achieve, I play the game better or I'll do something else. And then actually I realise I can actually hack into other players' accounts and steal their gold or their you know, inventory and things like that for my own gain. Well, actually, you're now starting talking about financial thing, and then I can sell that on to other players. I can start making some money from my skills. And then you're kind of up here, and then you get involved into the sort of thing where instead of me coming and saying, have you thought about this from a career perspective, it's now the six o'clock door knock, which you don't want, where we're coming in, and you're coming down to the police station. Yeah, so we're trying to say, before it gets up to here, let's get some involvement and try and steer people away from it. Um, Another thing that we look at is why people get involved in cybercrime and to a certain degree it's slightly different from some of the other types of crime that we look at. So we've talked about the fact that um, there's lots of stuff online that tells you how to do it. So I can find an idiot's guide of how to commit crime. But I'm also online and we know that when people go online there's this idea of anonymity. Yeah, so I'm now looking at a computer screen, it's not the real world and people are more willing to do things that they probably wouldn't be doing, willing to do face to face. Yeah, so this idea of anonymity and the idea that we're not, we're not policing the internet, but we are. Um, financial game is a bit of anything, but a large one is that challenge. So if I'm interested in tech, I'm interested in cyber, actually I want to test my skills. I want to see if I can get into that computer and that network. Yeah, just to say I managed it, I've achieved it, yes. Yeah, and what we, what we find is that people don't necessarily understand the implications of what happens next. If I've managed to get into the school network and I've taken the school network down, Kudos to me, I'm good at doing it, but actually the implications are, you know, that um, the school now can't run properly, there's implications on staffing and things like that. Um, so, for those of you who've done the quiz, we've kind of gone through this, Computer Misuse Act, 1990, so it's quite old, but it's still pretty good. Um, first section, unauthorised access. So that is me getting access to a computer when I haven't got consent to do it. So I look over somebody's shoulder, I see their username and password, they walk out the room, I log on without their consent and have a look through their messages and things. That's a, an offence under the Computer Misuse Act. That's an, I mean, that's a uh, breach in privacy. Yeah, it's breach in privacy, but it's also, uh, you know, accessing somebody's computer without their consent, so that'd be section one. Um, section two, we're moving on slightly. So I've got that access, but then with an intention to commit further crime. So you've gone out the room, I've got your uh, username and password, I've logged onto your computer and then I've gone onto your uh, Amazon account and I've ordered some stuff and got it delivered to my house. Yeah, so I've now committed fraud by using that computer access. Uh, section three, this is your DDoSing. So this is where I'm trying to impair a computer. So I'm gonna get into a computer without consent and then I'm gonna stop that computer working, either by flooding it with a load of traffic or causing it to crash or doing something else. Yeah, section three. Uh, 3ZA, for those of you who've done the quiz, says up to 14, but if it's, there's a threat, uh, risk of life, then it goes up to, to life. So we're now causing serious damage or risk of life. Yeah, so we're talking the real high-end sort of uh, attacks here, really. 
Uh, and then 3A is the other one that we, we do quite a lot of, which is where someone's got an article for use in. So somebody's got some sort of software or some sort of malicious um, virus or something on their computer, which they're going to use to do something. Someone's got a program that allows them to control a set of botnets, something else like that. If you've got those sort of systems that you've got on your computers, they're clearly going to be used for potentially committing an offence. So therefore, you're in possession of articles for using a crime. Um, so, yeah, they're the, the offences and yeah, there's prison sentences that come along with them. But really, the other consequences are receiving a war that warning from us, that six o'clock door knock, banned or limited internet usage. So we, we deal with a lot of individuals who no longer have any uh, IT access at schools or parents have taken internet access off them, things like that. Um, can impact on your ability to get a job later on down the life. Certainly if you've, you know, you've been arrested or convicted of computer misuse act, it might have an impact on your ability to get a job. Um, has an impact on your ability to travel. Anybody who gets convicted of a computer misuse offence is not going to the States. You will not get a visa to go to the States. Um, we're going to seize your devices and then we're going to examine those devices. We'll have them for quite a period of time. We've got a job that's going to court next year uh, and we seized the, well, the initial seizure of the devices in 2015. So we've had those devices for six years. So we can potentially keep them for a quite a period of time. So you can have no, no computers or devices to access. Yeah, okay, we might get kicked out of school as well. Can't get into college or universities or all of the above. Yeah, so this idea that actually, you know, there's, there's a big impact that it can have on you. And this is the only other thing I just want to touch on as well is just this idea of what are the implications. So people see cybercrime as a victimless crime, but actually there are underlying sort of things that happen. So when we deal with victims of crime, there are massive implications around sort of both the phys physical and the emotional things. So the stress, you know, people end up sort of like, you know, committing suicide on the back of having had their computers hacked and things like that. Massive implication from a financial perspective um, and a reputational perspective. Um, and one in four businesses that are hit by, with a cyber attack go out of business. So that business is out now closed down. All the people who work for that business are now unemployed. Massive, the ripple effect of that attack. Um, so this is the other side of what we're then saying is, so that's the stick, the carrot being actually, for those of you who've done the quiz, there's like over three million sort of shortfall in cybersecurity and, and, and tech industries. So actually trying to promote that positive career opportunities. Don't know if anyone was involved in the Matrix Challenge over the last few years. We do a lot of work with sort of like schools around, this is a cybersecurity challenge you know, testing sort of kids against uh, the, sort of the cyber sort of threats that we put out there and things like that. Next year is being run by the NCA. We're just waiting for that to come through. Um, cyber First with the National Cyber Security Centre, they do a lot of work at the earlier age. So we're trying to now engage with people sort of like 12, 13. Yeah, but when you come up this stage, we're then looking at some of the other sort of courses and things that are available, a lot of these being free. And there's bursaries out there for people trying to get to university. And it's not just cyber security, I'm trying to think wider than that as well, around some of the other sort of skills that people need from an information security point of view. Um, yeah, we do a lot of work around ethics, which we've kind of touched on, and then there's a lot of online sort of uh, available sort of things like immersive labs or hack the box, where people can sort of like develop their skills in a legitimate way. Yeah, so these are all virtual machines that have been set up and saying, yes, please come and attack me. I've set this up specifically, so you've got that consent. Oh, so like white hat training so white hat hacker training yeah absolutely yeah. but these are so we're not committing any offenses because yeah. i have the consent it's not unauthorized it's authorized access to crash it yeah please come and try and take that down on my my website yeah. um for those who do bug bounties you know this, there are companies out there that say have a look at my website and see if there are any vulnerabilities and let me know if there are and i'll pay you some money him down really quick and instead of holding lawsuits he invited him to work for a, to test the system every day yeah um, i know an individual from west yorkshire i think it's west I'm trying to remember where he is now um but he um he did some work with the paypal identified a vulnerability on paypal and got paid like thirty-five thousand pounds for identifying that vulnerability um so you know that there's it's well paid career if you can do it well um Okay, literally the last slide.
So that's kind of what I came to talk to you about today. Uh, any questions from anybody? I noticed um, some, I think there are screenshots or PDFs, whatever, in an earlier slide. Are they available online for the likes of teachers to access and so on and share with students? Yeah, absolutely. So the majority of the sort of um, the guidance that we rely on as part of the Protect is on the National Cyber Security Centre's website. Um, this bespoke stuff specifically around staff awareness for schools and things like that as well. Um, and then from a school perspective, if you have individuals that you are concerned might be on the cusp, we also have a referral mechanism. We're not about criminalising at that level. You know, what we don't want is six months down the line for some victim to report to us and we have to deal with them in terms of, so, you know, there's a referral process as well that we can talk about. So, yeah. Um, purely from a career perspective as well, um, I mentioned, obviously, that I, I was a police officer. I joined 20 years ago, so I came in uniform, drove a panda car around. There are now a lot of opportunities within policing as well, in terms of digital forensics. We have digital media investigators. We have um, people who come in um, through a civilian route, so not as a serving police officer to go out and knock doors in and arrest people, but a lot of other sort of skills that we need within policing. Danielle, um, you're, not, you're not a police officer, you didn't come in through that route, and you're now doing sort of protect and prevent sort of engagement works. So there's a lot of you know, opportunities within policing as well, and the wider law enforcement family. So, um, okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll let you get off on, on your day. So I hope that was beneficial to you of some variety. No? Okay. Thank you.